sorry. So yes, we are absolutely delighted to welcome Dr. Nicole Wilson tonight, who is currently a Leverhulme Trust Early Career Research Fellow at the Institute for Black Atlantic Research in the University of Central Lancaster, where she's working on her current project on Femme Rebelle, Recovering the Histories of Haiti's Women Revolutionaries. Her research focuses on the transgenerational legacies of the Haitian Revolution and more broadly um, on articulations of resistance across the Black Atlantic from the age of slavery to the present. She's published widely in these areas and um, I note that one of your forthcoming articles, Nicole, is a rather timely study of the politics and aesthetics of Black um, majesty, including Meghan Markle. Um, Nicole is also author of a forthcoming monograph on the Haitian Revolution, Literary Ghosts and the Incomplete Dream of America, currently under contract with Edinburgh University Press. So we're really delighted to welcome Nicole to speak to us tonight about Femme Rebelle, excavating the histories of Haiti's women revolutionaries. Thank you for that really generous introduction, Kate. Um, can I just say that I'm, I'm really grateful to have this opportunity to give a talk like this. Um, and I've, I've benefited immensely from these kinds of seminars in the past. And though I'm really sad that we don't have the opportunity to get together in person at the moment, so, uh, you know, I especially miss those kind of cheese and wine receptions afterwards. But I think that bowls of nibbles at those kinds of events might be a thing of the past now. So perhaps it's better this way anyway. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to say thank you for having me here. I'm really grateful to have the opportunity to share some of my work and, and to get some feedback uh, on it. And um, I really look forward to questions from the audience afterwards. So uh, to kick things off, I'm going to share my screen. Okay, hopefully you can all see that. So some of you present here will be familiar with the story of the Haitian Revolution. Some of you have contributed vitally to the telling and retelling of that story in vital and vibrant ways. To a voicing of a history that Haitian anthropologist Michel Hof Trio recognized as having been subject to forces of banalization and erasure and ultimately silence. Despite those valiant efforts, Haiti is still subjected to the same forces of discursive violence in the white Western world, reduced in popular media narratives to archetypes of disaster and political misrule. Diminishing the very fact that Haiti's very existence owes itself to the triumph of enslaved rebels who fought against an obliterated and entire colonial capitalist infrastructure. And I just wanted to share some snippets from a recent Sky News report on the protests against President Moise, which are currently going on in Haiti. Um, President Moise has uh, really just outstayed his welcome. He's outstayed his term in office and the people are protesting against this. But we're seeing this, this same kind of language uh, being mobilized in the media um, to, to kind of denigrate these efforts at, at resistance. For the sake of those less familiar with this story of this triumphal anti-colonial saga, I will crudely summarize. The country that we know today as Haiti was forged in the fires of revolution. More specifically, it emerged out of the largest and most successful rebellion of enslaved people in world history. Although the seeds of rebellious discontent have been cultivated over centuries by the authors of a brutal and dehumanizing colonial regime in what was then the French colony of Saint-Domingue, Tensions reached their peak in August 1791, when networks of enslaved and maroon rebels rose up in rebellion, setting fires on plantations across the Northern colonial territory. 
These events culminated in the universal and permanent abolition of slavery and an eventual quest for independence um, and self-determination from colonial rule. It was an unprecedented event that sent shockwaves across the slaveholding world. Of course, if stories of the Haitian Revolution and Haiti more generally remain subject to forces of banalization, erasure, co-optation and violence, then it is truer still of the stories of the women that contributed so integrally to this struggle. Thanks to the chroniclers of Haitian history and to those scholars that have contributed to the Haitian turn in Atlantic world scholarship in recent decades, the world knows more about heroic figures like Toussaint Louverture, Jean-Jacques Dessalines, and Dutty Bookman. But the names of Sanité Belair, Catherine Flon, and Cécile Fatima remain largely consigned to the margins. Ultimately, the historical archive and the epistemological tools that we are given to navigate this terrain is a large part of the problem. In his groundbreaking study, Silencing the Past, Power and the Production of History, Michel Fouftrio articulated how the archive functions as an instrument of colonialist containment. The voices of those so central to the story are so often absent because they do not have a manifestation in written language. Where we find traces emerge, these are so often refracted through the lens of the colonial interlocutor. In rare instances where personal written testimony survives, there is often a reflection, this is often a reflection on the privilege of access open to the few. It is not a prototype for the varieties of resistance enacted by women across a broad social and cultural spectrum in colonial society. The colonial archive therefore actively occludes and precludes the voices of those most central to an understanding of colonial history. It's therefore wholly inadequate for the purposes of restitution. However, we know that even in spite of the violence of repressive colonialist infrastructures, which sought to strip enslaved people of languages, communities, kinships, cultures, and so much more, rich countercultures emerged against the grain of dominant white colonialist archive. These countercultures became critical to the survival and preservation of enslaved histories and diasporic encounters. And so the archive of the Black Atlantic, which is abundant with stories inscribed in artworks, textiles, songs, foodways, spiritual practices, ecologies, architecture, and, per hope, and perhaps most importantly, in oral culture, remains a rich and still largely untapped resource that is issued by the Western episteme, by white Western systems of knowledge creation. The only reason that we know anything at all about some of the women in this saga is because traces of their creative and ingenious lives exist beyond the scope of the colonial record in archeological sites, private collections, and in the ancestral knowledge bank of memory. And I'm sharing here an image of an artifact that really um, kicked off this whole project. And it's a, a dress that belonged to the woman that you see on the right, who was known as Dame Eleanor Richeur. Um, she was also named as Dame Cheroussi, which is an anagra anagram of Richeur, uh, which is thought to have been her father's name. Um, her father was a white colonist um, who married a woman of colour in Saint-Domingue, and um, she became one of the ladies in waiting to uh, Queen Marie-Louise Christophe. And this dress was recently restored in Paris um, and it was, it was donated by the family to the uh, National Museum in Haiti. And it's just such a, a phenomenal artifact and I've learned uh, an awful lot more um, about it since I, I discovered its um, existence. 
thanks to discussions with the conservator and with the family who owned it. Um, so, you know, I'd be very happy to answer any questions that you might have uh, on that dress. And I'm such a magpie. I love clothes um, and material things. So um, I could go on about that forever, but for the sake of, of time, I'll, I'll press on. Admittedly, in carefully mining the alternative archives across which some of these women's stories are, are scattered, there is a balance to be struck. In some instances, it is clear that silence has given way to mythology and the cacophony of unverified and unverifiable sources further derails the mission of historical recovery and reassembly. The figure of Cécile Fatima, the manbo or priestess who presided over the Vaudou ceremony that marked the beginning of the Haitian revolution and about whom we know very little is a highly contested and much mythologized figure, for example. In various Haitian genealogies, she is often seemingly conflated with Genevieve Pierrot, who was in fact the sister of Marie-Louise Quadavid, um, or Marie-Louise Christophe, who was the wife of the revolutionary general and later King Henri Christophe. In many anecdotal accounts, Fatima is also described as a light-skinned, green-eyed, long-haired beauty. Though there are obvious visual parallels between this representation of Fatima and Ezeli Freda, the vaudou spirit of love, luxury, and refinement, her corporeality and her sensuality, which is so central to this mythic narrative and the story of female resistance built around it, tells us nothing about the struggles she endured as an actual black woman, quote, in a slave-holding society. And in this way, as Colin Dyan contends, quote, forestalls us turning to her real life, end quote. On the other hand, Fatima's symbolic potency in the Haitian popular imagination unsettles the idea that revolution is a militarized performance enacted exclusively by men and amplifies the significance of other strategies of resistance enacted and led by women in Saint-Domingue and beyond. Needless to say, absence and erasure in the archive has given way to abundance elsewhere. This abundance is hugely generative and allows us to envision multiple revolutionary possibilities, especially for women that the officially sanctioned histories fail to entertain. But it is always important to tread carefully and subject all sources to critical scrutiny. The goal of this project has been to traverse this sometimes unnavigable terrain in the full recognition of its imperfections and inad inadequacies. It embraces unconventional sources and alternative archives, while at the same time reading between the lines of colonialist histories, recognizing that, as Marlena Doubt has, has highlighted, colonial texts offer occasionally useful insights that lead us on a path to a greater truth. Ultimately, it is governed by a black feminist framework that, as Aisha K. Finch highlights, quote, asks us to resist the urge to neatly resolve these frictions, end quote. It hopes to bring new and unseen material to light, to share, circulate and preserve, but it also seeks to shine a light on the important acts of exca excavation, reclamation and reassembly that inform alternative cosmologies and epistemologies that have contributed to the building of alternative archives, which in turn facilitate new understandings. This project, which is a singular node within a wider constellation of engaged work, is guided by the precept of rassemblage, a Haitian Creole term that, as Gina Athena Ulysse has shown, offers a toolkit for assembly, compilation, enlisting, and regrouping. It also seeks to mobilize the importance of temoyage, of ideas of witness, testimony, preservation, and avowal. So the woman that led me on this quest was a woman who, some might argue, was not really a revolutionary at all. And she has started to occupy so much of this project's attention because of the unique documentary traces that she has left, um, as opposed to the ones that 
that leave barely any traces. In this sense, she is unique from some of the other women around whose stories this study revolves. I refer to Marie-Louise Christophe, born Marie-Louise Croix David, who I've mentioned previously, first and last queen of Haiti. Marie-Louise was the, the wife of revolutionary general and later king, Henri Christophe. Throughout the revolutionary tumult, she bore him four children, all of whom tragically predeceased her. One year after Christophe's death by suicide in October 1820 and the assassination of her only surviving son, she traveled to England with her daughters, Françoise Amétis and Anne Athénaïa, which they made their home for several short years before traveling to Europe. She eventually died in Pisa in 1851, outliving her husband by over 30 years. Though Marie-Louise's story is in part one of elite privilege, she remains, I believe, a symbol of revolutionary endurance and above all, survival. While other Haitian regimes rose and fell during the course of her lifetime, she continued to remake herself in and beyond Haiti. More than anyone else, she lived by the motto emblazoned at the heart of the royal household's coat of arms, Je renais de mes cendres, I am reborn from my ashes. I'm also interested in looking at Marie-Louise in conversation with some of those other revolutionary wives, such as Claire Heureuse Dessalines and Suzanne Louverture, who each had to create new lives for themselves in the wake of their husband's deaths. Um, and Suzanne also in a foreign country. These women, though marginal within the heroic military saga of Haitian revolutionary history, contributed vitally to national and international discourses around Haitian sovereignty by virtue of their continued presence within those communities. My curiosity in Marie-Louise in particular, however, was driven by my discovery of a translation of Marie-Louise's last will and testament in the UK National Archives in 2019. A rare and important discovery which became an important springboard for further discoveries about her interesting life in exile. It helped me to pinpoint a number of the places that she lived some of which I've subsequently had the privilege to be able to visit. These spaces have given me unique material insights into her life during a moment in time. Um, and these are pictures of the house that she stayed in in 1822 in Hastings. This document also gave me the impetus to set up my research website, femmebelle.com to create a resource in which these findings so long hidden could become accessible and of use, especially for people in Haiti. And it's my hope that the content on the site will soon also be translated into Creole. So you can find a transcription of her will along uh, with other archival documents in this space. More recently, I collaborated with the Haitian Chamber of Commerce in Great Britain to create a short documentary about her life in the UK, which has had um, an un unexpectedly astronomical reach, um, which is just incredible. It's more than we could have hoped for. So the fragments and traces that Marie Louise left behind essentially became the foundation of an archive of stories and network of collaborations centering on the histories of women in the Haitian revolution more broadly. Another personality that is central to this study of Haiti's femme rebelle is Catherine Flon. Unlike Marie-Louise, who left tangible and legible traces of her existence, Catherine Flon is a somewhat contested figure for whom no documentary trail really exists beyond the realm of oral history. Catherine Flon is at the center of a flag creation narrative that has become integral to the collective memory of Haitian independence. According to anecdotal accounts, Catherine Flon was the goddaughter of Jean-Jacques Dessalines. A nurse and a seamstress, Flon was purportedly charged with creating the 
occupation bicolor from the remnants of the French tricolor after Dessalines cut out the white strip with his sword at the Congress of Arcahai, which saw the leading revolutionary generals pledge their commitment to a single unified aim for independence on the 18th of May, 1803. Of course, this story has considerable symbolic potency. The repudiation of the tricolor's white strip is emblematic of a repudiation of white colonial authority more broadly. Much like the figure of Cécile Fatima, Catherine Flon has been subjected to rampant mythologization. Her story sometimes used to bolster a particular national narrative. But whether or not we see Catherine Flon as a real or representational figure who embodies the stories of multitudes of women occluded by history, her story amplifies the important material links between women, textiles, and insurgent activity in slaveholding societies such as Saint-Domingue. The archive points to the fact that enslaved seamstresses proliferated in pre-revolutionary Saint-Domingue. And we know that these women also had a myriad of other domestic skills connected with the production, care and distribution of textiles. Seamstresses or couturières were also often blanchisseuses or lingères laundresses, marchandes, merchants or traders, and ménagères, housekeepers. We know too that women with domestic, creative and caregiving skills played integral roles on revolutionary battle camps, especially as sutlers, nurses and cooks. Contemporary artworks by artists like Patricia Brintle and Nicole Jean-Louis featured here. And the wonderful artwork that you saw at the beginning was also an artwork by Patricia Brintle. Um, articulate the radical possibilities of Catherine Flon's occluded history. In Jean-Louis' painting, she actively redresses the imbalance of historical narratives of the Haitian Revolution by placing Catherine Flon at the epicenter of the action. Amid well-documented personalities like Jean-Jacques Dessalines, Henri Christophe and Alexandre Petillon. Though seated, Flon is by no means abject, but is rather a necessary cog within the machine. Significantly, she is given a visibility that the military masses obscured by the dark columns behind her are not. In Brintle's painting, Catherine Flon is imagined beyond the much mythologized moment of the Argai Congress. Sewing the Haitian coat of arms adopted in 1807 onto the established bicolor. In this way, she demonstrates how women continued to contribute to the project of independence and Haitian sovereignty long beyond the revolutionary moment. That Catherine Flon is depicted against the backdrop of lush verdure, the rolling mountains of Haiti that are inscribed in its Taino origins is also significant in registering the continued importance of history in the present. These vital contributions to the archive of radical creativity reaffirm the fundamental revolutionary value of female domestic labor and emotional work, highlighting alternative narratives of woman-led resistance. Finally, I'd like to talk briefly about the figure of Sanité Belair, whose story is one of revolutionary sacrifice. Sanité occupies a space somewhere between Marie-Louise and Catherine Flon. Though she has a documentary presence, it is only within the stories and letters of others whose evident biases have converged to create a sometimes less than favorable character. Sanité was the companion of General Charles Belair and is known to have fought at his side during the Haitian Revolutionary Conflict. In his compendious Histoire d'Haïti, the, his, the Haitian historian Thomas Madieu describes Sanité as a brigande, often unforgiving. The chroniclers of Haitian history have emphasized les barbaries or barbarities committed at the hands of Sanité, who, along with Belair, 
broke from Jean-Jacques Dessalines and other revolutionary compatriots still then fighting under the banner of the French flag in 1802. Along with a handful of other renegades, they led a failed insurgency, subsequent to which Sanité was captured. According to Madieu, Belair, unable to bear his separation from Sanité, gave himself up to French colonial forces. The prisoners were granted no clemency by their captors and were sentenced to death on the 5th of October, 1802. Belair, by firing squad in recognition of his rank as a brigadier general and at Sanité by decapitation. As Mariu recounts, Sanité demanded that she too be granted a soldier's execution by firing squad. As history recounts, she purportedly refused a blindfold and heeded her husband's entreaty to die bravely. Sanité represents a figure of interest in this study because she is at once an object of scorn and celebration in Haitian histories. Depicted in full military regalia, she is featured on the Digold Haitian banknote that was issued in 2004 to mark the bicentenary of independence. Artists such as Kimathi Donkor nevertheless present alternative visions of Sanité that nevertheless contradict the character envisioned by historical chroniclers such as Madiou and even the highly militarized public historical figure that we see on the banknote. In this painting, uh, the one that you see here on the right, Charles and Sanité Belair are shown nestled in a cliff top clearing between island and sea, surrounded by wild tobacco, cotton, sugar and indigo the lucrative crops of colonial slavery. Instead of military regalia, Sanité is depicted wearing a delicate blue empire line gown with a kerchief or matra in a matching hue tied around her head, emphasizing her femininity. She is shown in the loving embrace of her husband, their limbs interlocking and their hands interlaced around a musket as if in anticipation of an impending assault. By envisioning her in this way, Doncourt humanizes and renders fallible the woman immortalized in public history as a tigress. This is a project with grand ambitions, but it is also a project that is conscious of its limitations. Some of these limitations have been magnified in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic. The whole blueprint for this study was mapped against a presupposition that I would be able to access essential resources in archives, libraries and cultural heritage institutions across the world. This is an immense privilege and one that I recognise as such, but the setbacks that this project has suffered owing to issues of mobility and access created by the pandemic have highlighted just how inaccessible, fragile and imperiled some of these resources actually are. Haitian cultural patrimony is under threat on account of these problems. One of the primary goals of this project was to make shareable and accessible my research findings. I see this as integral to countering this endangerment, but I see myself very much as one link in the chain. It is only through active supportive collaborations strong networks and robust systems of knowledge transfer that we can begin to make changes in this area. And I hope that Femme Rebelle presents a useful model on which others can build as it has likewise taken inspiration from other like-minded projects. Given the restrictions imposed by the pandemic and the paucity of known sources which can be subjected to rigorous analysis, I fully concede that this study as ambitious as it aspires to be will undoubtedly have gaping holes. It will be imperfect. But hopefully in raising the profile of women that conventional histories have consigned to the margins, better and more insightful work will follow and efforts can be concentrated on restoring and recovering the materials that are so vital to the many tellings of these stories to Haiti. Though I am indebted to the women that have fallen through the cracks of the colonial archive, to the invisible women and the women that have been violently anonymized. 
I am also indebted to the women that have striven to counter this erasure, neglect and violence by carefully inscribing themselves into that record. Though my study centers on a handful of these women in Haitian history, I refer here to the Haitian women writers and scholars within the feminist movement that from at least the turn of the 20th century have contributed to the advancement of knowledge about Haiti's femme rebelle. These women who conducted a series of important but barely known, rarely cited and impossible to access studies on the social and economic welfare of women in Haiti had a conscious sense of history's lingering shadow, of its enduring transgenerational legacies and how those legacies manifested in ongoing struggles in Haiti in the present. But their work also had a conscious sense of its own historical importance, of its role in helping to shape and define history by recording the important social realities faced by Haitian women and by striving to recuperate some of those stories of important historical women too often consigned to the margins. The introduction to Madeleine, Madeleine Sylvain Boucheru's 1957 study, Haiti et ses femmes, reads, the history of Haiti has been entirely written by men and for men, and one hardly finds any trace of women of their moral, social, and economic influence. The history of the Haitian woman is yet to be written. The person who undertakes this difficult task will have much to do, and it will only be through fragments hitched together here and there that they will be able to determine the condition of women in any given period. In hitching together some of these fragments, I hope to continue the work of these inspirational women. Thank you. I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. There we go. Thank you very much indeed, Nicole. That was wonderful. And I really enjoyed your discussion of alternative archives and how we might be able to find the voices of women in those fragments. Um, while um, people are thinking of their questions, and as I said before, you can enter your questions into the chat, you can raise your <coughs> digital or literal hand. Um, I wanted to give you the opportunity to talk about the dress that you um, showed at the beginning of the presentation and um, what can we learn from material sources such as the, uh, the dress in, in general and what did you learn specifically about um, the lives of Haitian women or a specific Haitian woman through um, examining that dress? Yeah, well, thanks. Thanks for the opportunity to talk about that more, Kate. Um, you know, it's something that I'm really fashionate, really, really fashionate about, really passionate about. I'm really passionate about fashion. Um, well, I guess that that physical things, more broadly, material culture, tells us a lot about the things, the things that people have invested with um, with care, um, and so they they reveal kind of deep personalized insights, I think, about, um, about their owners. You know, we can tell how, uh, how much somebody loves something by how well worn it is. For example, if, it, if it's a, a very worn piece of fabric, we know that it was worn quite regularly. Um, but equally, you know, if that, if that piece of fabric um, is pristine, we know that it was, um, in, it was a, a highly prized and, and well-regarded um, artifact. Uh, so, you know, just by looking at things like that, we can, we can tell a lot about the person who owned it. Um, but this dress in particular was brought to my attention uh, by a friend, um, and I think I, I saw that he's here tonight, Paul Klammer, um, who's who's very close with um, some of the conservators at the National Museum in Haiti. And um, they uh, gave him a, a kind of a sneaky peek of this. And, and, you know, he told me that it was going to be there. And he said, you know, he, he knew that I was really interested in dress and fashion. He said, you know, this, this thing is here and you really need to get yourself here to see it. And unfortunately, I've not had an opportunity to travel to Haiti to see it. 
since that moment because of the pandemic and because of various other things before then. Um, but I have had the opportunity to speak with the conservator in Paris. Uh, so I met her last year. Uh, I was out in Paris just before everything shut down. And um, she gave me this dossier on, um, uh, on everything uh, that she did to kind of date the, the dress um, and to like restore it and bring it back to its former glory. Because I mean, it was just really filthy uh, when she got it and she had to really carefully uh, wash it and um, sew parts of it together again and you know do this really really carefully it's it's really delicate work um but but yeah i mean she she suggested that um it was a, a dress from a slightly later period and that it might not have actually been worn in the court of henri christophe so although this woman belonged to the court of henri christophe um, she doesn't think that it was it's actually from that period it's from a later time but that in itself is interesting because, you know, it's it's a story of a woman outside of the parameters of a, a certain point in Haitian history. So it's not circumscribed by uh, the kind of Christophian moment. And so then again, that is another story of endurance and survival. Thank you. C can you tell very quickly from the dress, um, you know, was this the height of fashion at the time? Or can you tell something about, you know, uh, her, uh, the economic state that she's in at that moment that she may have been wearing the dress? Yeah, I mean, it's, um, I mean, I don't, I don't know if you could tell uh, from the image that I showed, but it's like this light cotton uh, muslin fabric. Uh, so, you know, it, it wouldn't have been a cheap item to produce. And the embroidery on it is very detailed. There's, there's embroidery all along the, the bottom of the dress. And the conservator actually thinks that it may have been produced in, in France or somewhere else in Europe. Uh, I mean, we know from uh, newspaper reports that the Queen of Haiti ordered court dresses to be made in England. Uh, there's, there are really wonderful reports of the court dresses that were made by uh, London's top dressmakers for the Queen of Haiti with all these like gold sunflowers and everything. So, so yeah, it, this was most likely um, the height of fashion, you know, but it, it depends the height of fashion where, the height of fashion in France or the height of, uh, in Paris um, or the height of fashion in London, you know, so there were different things. Thank you, it's, it's wonderful. So the, the questions are rolling in. Um, Gad has his hand up and then I'll go to one in the chat. Thank you, uh, Nicole, that was really great. Uh, lots of very interesting material. Um, I was really struck by your mentioning Suzanne Louverture. I think we'd like to know more about her if, if you know anything more about her. And I was also wondering um, how these women are remembered or thought about in present day Haiti, if you get a sense of that idea. Thank you. Yeah, um, thanks, Gad. Well, I haven't done an awful lot of work on Suzanne Louverture. Um, I mean, I'm kind of interested in her in, in relation to Marie-Louise Christophe um, because there, there are certain parallels between their lives in that they, they, both, um, they both had to kind of re remake themselves in a, in a foreign country after their husbands died. Well, I mean, Suzanne... Um, followed Toussaint out, out to France, of course, um, and, and subsequent to that, he died in, um, in prison in the Jura Mountains. Um, but, you know, there, there are kind of lots of things um, to be, there are, there are lots of interesting avenues to be pursued and, and there, are, there is kind of quite a lot of content in the archives. Um, relating to Suzanne Louverture's life. Um, one of my, my friend's colleagues, uh, Stephanie Chauncey, is working um, on Louise Chauncey, who was um, um, the, the wife of Isaac Louverture, um, who was obviously um, uh, Toussaint's son. And, um, and so she would 
she might be able to tell you more about uh, Suzanne's journey and afterlife than I could, and has probably had a, a chance to, to consult some of those sources. But in a way, I'm kind of, I'm less inclined to pursue those avenues because they are easy avenues to pursue. You know, there are, there is a lot of archival content that is there and I know that it's there and I know that I can go and pursue it um, whenever I want to. So I want to try and focus my energies on um, doing some of the, the harder and difficult work. Um, that said, you know, people like Marie-Louise have, have uh, kind of occupied a lot of my time and mind space over the past year in particular because we had the bicentenary of Christophe's death last year and it's actually the bicentenary of her arrival in England this year and um, so you know there's, there's a lot of work to be done around that um, as, as far as how these women are remembered in Haiti um, you know there is a, a lot of love uh, for these women in Haiti you know that they're, they're celebrated um, in, in murals in artworks and on, um, on, on Haitian currency. Uh, Catherine Flon is also a figure uh, that is, is um, represented in, in Haitian currency. And there was a commemorative coin um, produced featuring Marie-Jeanne Le Martignat, who um, was another um, military female figure from the Haitian Revolution. So certainly, you know, in public discourse is very much there. And, um, you know, in, in Haitian culture, women are, are described as the potomitan, um, the central pillar of Haitian society. And I, th I think there's very much a sense of that in lots of kind of ongoing narratives. Uh, the Haitian filmmaker Etan Dupin has uh, recently released a documentary film called Madame Sarah, which is about the, um, the, the market women um, in Haiti, uh, the Madame Sarah um, and, and traders. And I think that this film really kind of, it, it celebrates the kind of historic legacy of women in Haiti and their historic contributions. Great, thank you very much. So I was struggling with unmuting. Um, there's a question in the chat from André Lamotte um, asking, can you speak to the usage of Saint-Domingue parish archives and Haitian civil records in uncovering the stories of women? Um, sorry, civil, civil records and parish archives in Saint-Domingue. Um, well, in, in all honesty, I haven't had uh, many opportunities to, to consult this sort of information. Um, I had hoped to go out to Aix en Provence last year where um, a lot of the Haitian Revolutionary Archives are. Um, I mean, I think that all archives are valid and useful, although they are flawed. I think that we have to consult everything that's available to us and really kind of scour them and mine them for information. And in many ways, that's why I've renamed this project Excavating the Histories of Haiti's Women Revolutionaries, because, you know, this is a constant process of excavations, of mining, of gathering. Um, and, you know, recovering denotes that there is a, an end point to this process. And I don't think that there is ever an end point, um, especially in in attempting to recover some of these histories um, of, of women in the Black Atlantic. So we have another question on sources. So Miriam Francina says, thank you for this talk. As someone who's trying to reconstruct a bit of Marie Louise's life in Pisa, I admire the variety of sources you're working with. Do you have any assumptions as to why Marie Louise chose to relocate to Tuscany? That's a great question. Uh, thank you for that, Miriam. Um, and I'd love to talk to you afterwards about this. Again, I'd, I'd also hope to travel to Italy last year, um, but wasn't able to do so um, because of the pandemic. Um, so yeah, I, there are a number of reasons why 
why Marie Louise and her daughters settled in that region. Um, and I think that it, it was predominantly for the health sake of her daughter. So she found the, the climate of, um, of Italy, of, of Pisa, and um, the surrounding areas much more salubrious. And she, I mean, she suffered from rheumatism. And we know that from uh, a letter that her daughter wrote to Mrs. Clarkson in um, the October of 1822, when she was staying at the house in Hastings uh, that I mentioned in the talk. Um, so, so she suffered from rheumatism, but both of her daughters, well, at least one of her daughters suffered from a respiratory condition. Um, I mean, it, it could have been asthma, it could have been anything really, um, but it, it seemed that the, the environment of Italy was much more favorable to them. And I, I found a, a letter again, thanks to my friend Paul, um, who told me about, he thought that there might be this letter um, or this diary entry by, by Robert Inglis in the Canterbury Cathedral archives, a very kind of obscure archive, um, but Paul has done so much um, kind of data mining to figure out where so certain sources might be. Uh, so I just went there and I found this, uh, this diary entry by Robert Inglis who visited Marie Louise at the house in Pisa in 1841. And this is, uh, this is after the death of both of her daughters. And uh, he, he says in this that uh, he encouraged her to come back to England, um, that you know, she would be well, well received and everyone missed her. Um, and she said that she, she would have come back to England if it weren't for the health sake of her daughters. So that gives us a strong indication of why they stayed where they did. Um, but as to why she then never, never moved on from there, I, I would only assume because um, it, it would have been too much or too kind of overbearing on her as well. Thank you. Um, there's a, a very big question in the chat, which is um, Terence is asking if you can talk about the punishment and backlash that Haiti has experienced to this day because of their successful revolution. Yeah, um, thank you for that question, Terence. Um, I mean, well, we, we see it. We see it continuing um, in this day uh, in, in the media, uh, you know, the kind of prevailing silence um, the prevailing failure to, to reckon with colonial legacies. Uh, this is something that we see not just here in the UK, but in, everywhere across the Atlantic world, um, and especially in, um, in those areas where, uh, you know, there were kind of colonial empires, right? So, you know, France um, has, uh, repeatedly failed to reckon with its colonial legacies. And, you know, even in the wake of, of the, uh, George Floyd's murder in, in the United States last year, when um, this kind of whole debate was, was thrust into the popular imagination once again, a lot of uh, interlocutors in France were just like, um, no, racism is an American problem. Don't try and transport it over here and say that we have a problem with racism. We don't. But of course, we know that's not true. Um, you know, and, and there are uh, prevailing legacies of this. The, the, the poverty that, that Haiti has suffered is a result of the massive indemnity that it was forced to pay to France um, for recognition of its sovereignty in the 19th century and to basically stop France um, threatening to invade all the time because there were, there were gunships off the Haitian coast that, that really continually threatened Haitian sovereignty throughout that early period. So, you know, Haiti was stuck between this rock and a hard place. It had to, to pay this indemnity. I mean, some some scholars would argue that they didn't necessarily, they didn't have to pay it, but there were 
there were few choices that Haiti was left with. And now, of course, there are opportunities to redress this balance, to at least acknowledge the role the, that colonial governments have, have played in perpetuating inequalities and in propagating certain mythical and untrue narratives. But, but they don't. Um, and, you know, I, I watch French news occasionally, and there are a lot of reports at the moment um, on unrest in Burma and absolutely zero information about what's going on in Haiti. And, and that is no accident, I don't think. Oh, well, certainly nothing in the press here either. No. Um, so there's a question from Crystal Eddins, um, who asks, is there any sense of what happened to the descendants, great grandchildren or grandchildren of either Christophe or Toussaint? Yeah, thanks, uh, Crystal. Um, well, I mean, if you look at some of the comments on uh, my the YouTube documentary that I made with the Haitian Chamber of Commerce, there are some people who, who think that, or, or they claim that they are the, the great, great descendants of Henri Christophe. So, you know, it, it's very possible, of course, um, because, you know, um, Christophe did have uh, children by other women. Um, and uh, Toussaint was famously had uh, lots of paramours, supposedly. Um, he had lots of trinkets from them anyway, uh, according to the historical narrative. Um, but yeah, I mean, with Toussaint, there, there are more legible traces. And uh, some of those descendants uh, from the Toussaint, uh, from the Louverturian line, um, they have, have given us, have contributed to these wonderful uh, visual cultures, Haitian visual culture. So uh, Séjour Le Gros, who I think was his nephew um, and um, was, was related to him through the, the Chancy line. I could be getting this all wrong. And Stephanie is probably here and, and hearing me get it all wrong. But, um, but she will avow to the fact that Haitian genealogy is complex. Anyway, Séjour Le Gros painted um, the, the portrait of Louise Chancy, um, which is at Mupana, and also an, another portrait, portrait of, um, of Leonice Legros, um, who was his sister. And they are uh, gorgeous images. Uh, if you haven't got them or seen them, I'll send them to you. Um, and yeah, it'd be great to continue the conversation after this. Thanks for coming, Crystal. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So there's a question from Ronald Roberts who asks about on those backlash issues, what's the alignment of the Chamber of Commerce that you mentioned? Have they spoken out on anything in any way? And does this reduce the work with them to an antiquarian or coffee table artifact? What was the thought process around that collaboration? Okay, um, so uh, the, the Haitian Chamber of Commerce is uh, completely separate to the Haitian Embassy. Um, though, I, though I have uh, done some work with the Haitian Embassy in the past, but um, the Chamber of, of Commerce was established by uh, Wilfred Marus, um, who I, I'm not sure if he's here, but if he's here, hi Wilfred. Um, and it was to kind of, the, the aim of it was to promote um, Haitian trade and investment and, and that kind of thing. And really um, the, the impetus behind that project um, came from uh, Wilfred and Michelet, Michelet is the, the vice president, um, who, and, and they were just kind of interested in, um, in continuing to bridge those connections through culture um, and seeing culture as a route to establish further commercial relations um, with the country and, um, and further com conversations around those kinds of connections, I guess. Um, but yeah, with, um, with the, the embassy, um, I mean, the, the situation is, is complex, I think, because of the political situation. 
Um, I mean, I, I haven't um, done any work with them closely lately, um, but the, the former Chagre de Fer, I was uh, very close with, um, and she was, uh, she was involved and spoke at the uh, webinar that I coordinated with, um, with the Courtauld Institute back in October. But in terms of um, speaking out, uh, it, I, I mean, I haven't heard any kind of speaking back to what's going on right now from, from that corner, but that's not to say that it's, it's not happening. Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, I wonder if I could take you back to this question of, you know, archives and alternative sources and so forth. And, you know, you said you're excavating from these fragmentary pieces that exist and also um, you know, reading between the lines of colonial archives and um, other oral history sources and so forth. And I'm not quite sure how to articulate my question, but there's sort of the, you also mentioned, you know, the stories of these women have also passed into myth. And I wondered, have you, have you had any situation where you found something sort of concretely in the archive that contradicts the myth? And if so, does that, you know, because I think that the myth matters as much as the kind of this is the fact that actually happens. So I, again, I'm not quite sure how to articulate this, but that kind of tension that there is between maybe finding out something that may undermine the myth and, and to what extent does that matter? To what extent you're trying to kind of present a kind of reality versus myth, which I'm sure is not what you're trying to do. Sure, no, 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 I get completely where you're coming from, Kate. And um, I guess the, the short answer to that is no, um, but, you know, when, when you're working with such limited range of archival sources, it, it, it's, you know, that's quite difficult. I guess, you know, in, in working, I mean, all of these figures have been mythologized in some way, you know, so even people like Marie Louise, who left uh, more documentary traces than some of these other women, have been mythologized in, uh, in Haitian history and, and outside of Haitian history, um, you know, in, in the histories written by colonizers. Um, and so actually finding documentary traces enables you to kind of be able to say, well, she was here at this time. She was doing this at this time. Um, she, she lived in Italy for this period. Um, and, you know, she, she did X, Y, and Z. So, you know, we can create a more complete picture of, of someone's life, for example, but whether we find anything that can categorically disprove any of those mythologizations, I, I don't know. So, you know, the figure of Ceci of Fatima is really interesting because um, a lot of people actually seem to think that she might have been the sister of Marie-Louise Christophe. Um, and that's because um, according to, to certain historical narratives, she was married to Jean-Louis Pierrot, who was the husband of Genevieve Pierrot, who was Marie-Louise's sister. So, uh, but all myths start somewhere, right? So, you know, it's very possible that she was married, that Cécile Fatima was married to this man, um, and that Genevieve Pierre was also married to this man at another time. Um, and, and perhaps this is where two stories kind of get intermeshed with each other. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it's, I guess it's just about trying to prise those things apart and subject them to as much critical scrutiny as possible. And while also recognizing the fact that we can't really ever categorically disprove something. Um, and, you know, something has a genesis somewhere. Thank you. Um, there's a message from Dave Dunkley, who says to convey his thanks for the very interesting talk. And can you speak a bit more on why not much archival documentation is available for historical research on women of the revolution? Hmm. Um, yeah, sure. Um, 
thank you for that for that question. I mean, this is a problem with archives of Atlantic slavery broadly, and and really speaks to uh, the, the lack of sources that we have for um, women across the Atlantic diaspora. And, you know, that has a lot to do with the fact that, um, that women of color, especially enslaved women, were not often uh, given the tools to uh, ins inscribe uh, their own experiences in the written record. Um, so, you know, in, in a lot of colonial societies, in colonial North America, in the colonial Caribbean, in colonial South America, um, you know, literacy was considered a considerable weapon and a tool. And, you know, we know that it became such. People like Frederick Douglass and David Walker have proved how, how literacy could become a tool and become a weapon um, for insurgency and for resistance against white colonial authorities and infrastructures. So colonial authorities were very conscious of that and, and so actively tried to suppress access to those weapons and tools in the same way that they, that they tried to suppress access to physical weapons and tools. And, and so, yeah, the, the, the stories that we find, um, and it's, especially when we're looking at um, the history of the Haitian Revolution, which is above all a military, a story of military encounter. Although, as I've tried to articulate, it's a story of, of many kinds of revolutions. It's a story of, of many other uh, kind of articulations of resistance. The ones that the archives are concerned about are the stories of military encounter. Um, and, you know, the stories of those main uh, historical agents you know, so a, a lot of um, the interest is around those figures. But even in those stories, we do see some uh, interesting fragments. We can find some interesting fragments about, about women. Um, so when I was in the uh, University of Florida archives a couple of years back, I found a, a fantastic uh, fragment about a, a woman insurgent who was known as Boule Le Kai or Burn the Keys. It's like, wow, that's that's amazing. That was that was her name. That's wonderful. Um, God has his hand up. Yeah, I don't want to keep you, uh, Nicole. This is really interesting. But one of the things that you mentioned that was so fascinating was the Marie Louise's connection to Clarkson. We know that the abolitionists had uh, connections to other revolutionary leaders, but here's one to the women. Is this unique? Are there other connections that we know about? Um, not, not that I know of in particular with Clarkson. Um, and and my, my knowledge of, of Clarkson uh, and his, uh, his kind of abolitionist anti-slavery activities are sort of limited to his interactions with Marie Louise. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, but yeah, I mean, her and her daughters stayed at his house for probably a, half a year after her arrival. And you know, from from what I gather, uh, Clarkson was, was very happy to entertain them and you know extend the hand of friendship and, and say you know have my home as refuge. But uh, some of his later letters. Um, in, in that sort of, in those last few months of their stay indicate that they were, um, that he hadn't anticipated that they would stay quite so long. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. yeah. Soon, they, soon they found other accommodations and, um, and yeah, so they, they moved to Blackheath after that and then to Hastings and then to central London before, um, before moving to, to the continent. Thank you. Um, I might squeeze in one tiny one about, you know, archives again, and that's just um, whether you've got any sense of the context in which Marie Louise's um, a translation of her will ends up in, in the National Archive. Um, yeah, actually we do. Um, that's because she asked, she asked for a, a translation to be made available 
um, for the Public, Public Records Office in London. So, um, you know, even though her, her will is a mediated document, you know, it's, a, it's, it's written that it's a non-cupative testament. So she is, is speaking and somebody else is, is transcribing uh, her last will and testament. But there is a sense of agency there, of willful agency, that she's not only inscribing herself, but she's re-inscribing herself, right? You know, she's, she's asking for uh, duplications of this document to be made, a document that had already been made in Haiti. So she, she made an original testament in Haiti before she even left in 1821. And then, you know, she makes her final, her last will and testament in Italy in 1841, which is, which is amended just before she dies in 1851. Great, thank you. Um, I don't think there are more questions in the chat. There are many thank yous and much appreciation for your paper. Um, so, I think um, we can draw this to a close and to thank Nicole um, very much indeed for such a stimulating paper. It's a great project and um, I, I hope that we'll be able to um, have you back further down the line um, to launch whatever further um, books, articles or um, websites that may come out of this project because I can see how generative it's going to be. Um, thanks to everyone for coming. Um, I don't have my list in front of me, but we do have a very rich program uh, in the summer term for the Caribbean seminar series. So we're going to have Philip Nanton speaking about Shape Keen. We're going to have Eve Hayes de Cala speaking on statelessness and citizenship in the Dominican Republic. And there's a third one. Uh, Tim Lockley, Tim Lockley on uh, uh, the West India Regiment in the 1812 war. Perfect. So anyone who would like to um, uh, attend those events, then you can write to our events manager, Oscar Martinez, on, who would have emailed you the link for this event and ask to be added to our mailing list for the Caribbean seminar series. And we hope to um, welcome you back in the summer term. So thank you again, Nicole. Thank you to everyone for attending. And um, yeah, I really enjoyed all the beautiful images and I'm very happy to see that the, the artist is here. Yeah, I just wanted to actually uh, give a quick hello to Pat. Um, hi, Pat. It's really lovely to see you. And um, for everyone else here, Pat's sitting in front of some of her absolutely gorgeous artwork. And it's just really exciting for me to see that. And um, what a, a wonderful opportunity for you to all see it as well. Um, so thank you all for coming. And if you have any further questions, um, please do get in touch with me via my institutional email and check out the website. Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Thank you again, Nicole. Thanks, Nicole, that was great.